Welcome to another episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo. For those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as several other cities across Canada. Founded by Monsignor Jean Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, religious, brothers and sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, this podcast features the talks following the Heralds' weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, where the brothers share some consoling and encouraging thoughts precisely geared to those dreaded beginnings of a probably hard week called Mondays. If you want to know more about the origin of the podcast, please stop right here. Go back and listen to episode number one. So even if today it's not Monday, but you're still commuting or doing chores, take heart brighten your perspectives and enjoy today's talk recorded at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg. The topic on the virtue of compassion with Brother Justin Bonian. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. <laughs> Welcome to one more magical Monday. And today, we are recording in the, the Herald's house here in Schaumburg, still under this veil of the pandemic, of this COVID-19 uh, crises. And so today we're going to be talking about compassion. The Catholic way of looking at compassion, we're going to look at um, and how, that, how that's going to help us um, to be more understanding to others, right? Um, I'm going to go so far as saying sometimes we have to be compassionate with ourselves because we um, we put demands that we're unable to match up with. But today we're going to develop this and, and work it out and, um, and and compare it with some of the things that you may see in your um, social groups, um, your pop psychology or Facebook uh, posts. And we're going to try to whittle away the falsehoods and bring us closer to truth. Because with truth uh, brings consolation and brings happiness. And we all want happiness. So let's go back and look at it. So we're looking at the virtue of compassion today. Okay, so let's go from the first point was that the devil is the great deceiver and he's the great liar. So he makes a mask. He makes a bogus version of every true virtue. So the virtues are ways in which that we can make ourselves closer to what God wants of us and to make us better people, to make us more godly, more godlike. So let's go through a few of the bogus versions of the true um, um, virtues. So the first one is full hardiness, you know, the fool who makes all the risks. And that sometimes passes as courage. Timidity is a common one for pa- for prudence, right? Apathy for patience. Credulity for faith. We forget faith has to be have a divine aspect to it. But there are no greater counterfeits out there and more su- Success in covering up and obscuring the genuine aspect in our present day than false compassion. Okay, so false compa- Okay, false compassion is what we have today. It's virtue signaling. It's all of that. So, first point is is that compassion is not a new virtue. It is not something that's just been uh, devised by some influencer on Instagram or on Twitter. It's been around as long as time exists, okay? But many a times people employ it with this wide-eyed excitement, and they like 
they come to you with this point that it's new and exciting and, and it never existed before. But we forget that it's cited throughout Holy Scripture, both old and new. So St. Augustine in his Confessions writes about it in the 5th century. He discusses the fraternal compassion we owe to others and advises that we should prefer to find nothing in them that would elicit our compassion. So the idea of giving of our compassion without looking for anything in return. St. Bernard in the 12th century said that Christ is our primary teacher of compassion because he willed his passion so that we could learn compassion. And again, the great Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century wrote about how our compassion can and will mendicate the sufferings of a friend. Now, that's all good. But history teaches us something. The meaning of compassion is really important. We have to define ourselves well. Okay? So as to leave us with a little excuse for confusing it with pity. Compassion. Compassion is rooted in love. It takes on the pain of the sufferer. Okay, that's really important, people. Really important. When you are compassionate, that means you carry the weight of their sufferings on yourself. When you just feel sorry for someone, that is pity. That's something very different. So you take on the sufferings of the other, the pain, the sufferings, the the anguish of the other, but with hope that some positive good will emerge from the shared suffering. Hope is key to it. Hope is the Rosetta Stone of it, you may say. Pity, on the other hand, which is more closely associated with a feeling, a sensibility, than with the virtue of love, is devoid of hope. And this is why a sufferer welcomes compassion, but despises pity. You know, you might hear this when someone's really suffering, I don't want your pity. This cry implies the fertility of pity. And yet... Pity, which has within it an insensitivity to the other's sufferings, makes the person even more despicable. Now, a great German philosopher, Nikolai Bernuski, makes a valid and interesting point when he looked at the the philosophy, I'm not going to refer to it as religion because it really isn't, of Buddhism. And also Pope Benedict made a phrase which is also very close to this, in which Buddhism, instead of looking towards the eternal, it looks towards the self, and it finds this the self, the eternal. And actually, in the end, the nothingness is the eternal. So it really is a very dark ending. But he states that in Buddhism, compassion means a desire that the sufferer should attain non-being and is a refusal to bear sufferings on behalf of others as well as oneself. Okay? And then he continues, in Christianity, compassion means a desire for a new and better life for the sufferer and a willingness to share in their sufferings. And Buddhism. Buddhism is very different because Buddhism's compassion is in a reality pity. It does not raise to the level of Christian compassion because it lacks both love in the person who has pity and hope for the other who is suffering. And it's because of that that the Russian goes on to say that pity may turn into the worst possible state into the rejection. Both of God and man, pity can be the source of rebellion against God. Wow, okay. So for the Christian, suffering is not necessarily meaningless. 
Indeed, it can be redemptive. For a Christian to share the sufferings of another means that by doing so, he brings or she brings a light into the pain and misery of that person's life. He blesses the other person's existence with a higher meaning. Christian compassion is, therefore, bound up in the most amazing of all mysteries, the mystery of the cross. Now, the problem we have is that everyone is spoon-fed the Oprah doctrine of life. They all go to the Oprah school or the Oprah church, and we end up with this humanistic compassion. It's another variety of the false compassion. It's based on the illusion that it is possible to free human beings from suffering altogether. There's no original sin. There's no no redemption, nothing. We're going to find a human way of having you freed of the shackles of suffering. And with that freedom of suffering... We're going to supply them with uninterrupted happiness. This cruel illusion is so rampant in the present therapeutic culture of the hospitals and clinics and philosophy and psychology, etc. And that's really terrible because it believes that the road to happiness passes through a pharmaceutical company. I give you these pills and you will be happy. But since Humanistic compassion is neither realistic nor rooted in love. It's simply another form of pity. Now, there was, a, there was a two Germans, Hosch and Binding, who wrote a book which was called The Release of the, St- of the Destruction of Life Devoid of Value. This work, published in 1920, was to pave the way for the Nazi eugenics movement and program later on. They wrote and wax eloquently about compassion. In one passage throughout this book, the characteristics that came through this book, the authors write, and I quote, a terrible testimony of the morals of our time. We are spending lots of time, patience, and care on their survival of life, devoid of value. Every reasonably thinking person would hope for its end. Our compassion is going beyond reasonable measure until it reaches cruelty. To deny the uncurable patient a peaceful death he so much desires is no longer compassion but the opposite. So basically, they were the ones that begot the mentality of the euthanasia movement that we have today. So, compassion is expediency in disguise. You know, of all the virtues, probably in our world, our contemporary world that we live in, the most unpopular of all the virtues is probably the virtue of chastity. But compassion is clearly its favorite. And it's because the cultural modus that we live in, that we have compassion for others. Compassion of popularity and are popular. Unfortunately, is so great that it tends to isolate this virtue from all those other factors it needs to have in order to it to remain a virtue. Compassion becomes an argument onto itself. So to speak, it justifies everything. Compassion is the tool to justify every delinquency. So, ju- so compassion justifies abortion, justifies euthanasia, it, it, uh, sterilization of the poor. It justifies everything. Sundry actions reducing misery and cur- that currently affect and afflict our humankind. Separated from love, light, generosity, hope, patience, courage, and determination, compassion becomes nothing more than a code word whose real name is expediency. 
it may be true that more lives are dispatched in the name of compassion than are lost in wars. When compassion becomes a principle, it ceases to be a virtue. As a principle, all it means is we find the easiest way out of any given position. A person who experiences pity is in a position to feel morally superior to those who are devoid of pity. And in this case, the person is right. A little bit of rectitude can be a dangerous thing. What the person may not realize is the moral superiority of loving compassion. But if we are very well with this, we're filled with a sense of humanistic righteousness. You know, like those people who justify the killing of the infirm or the killing of the unborn or whatever. One name comes to mind. It was in the 80s and 90s that Jack Korvekian, right, with his plan just to compassionately, but not essentially inhumane. So this is how it works. And there was a book written by a lady. Her name was Rita Markers. And she wrote this book called Deadly Compassion. How through compassion we put the person away. The problem with pity is not that it is inhumane. The problem with pity is that it's only too humane. Its problem is that it cannot transcend suffering. It means and it finds as a mean itself. And in fact, overwhelmed by itself. Pity ultimately is so humane that it excludes the very God that we should worship. You know, that's, that's the terrible point about it. The Russians, again, we go to Ivan Karzmanov in Dostoevsky's great novel, could not believe in God as long as one child was in torment. And we see that's where Ivan breaks in his work. And in the godless philosophical school of Albert Camus, heroes could not accept the divinity of Christ because of the slaughter of the innocents. The way in which popular piety marks our gain in sensibility, but at the cost of narrowing our vision to the point where pain is all that we can see, Christianity and the therapeutic culture are at odds with each other on the fundamental question, and this is key, the fundamental question of how we should respond to another person's pain. Christianity is not and cannot be looked upon as a means that is insensitive to pain, nor to the anguish of the sufferer. But, Unlike the drug druggist um, pharmaceutical society that we live in, the Christian brings to his suffering neighbor love, hope, and the light of Christ. When we speak to others who are in that state of suffering, what's important is that we have to remember the word compassion, what it means. The word compassion means to suffer with someone doesn't mean to suffer looking down at the person or throwing money at them or what have you. It's to be with them and to suffer with them. With a sense of coming to the person's aid, it is an emotion in us that caused by an evil or dire situation that we see in the other. For example, the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan had no reason to have to go to and help that Jew that was beaten up by his own co-countrymen, by that brigands and, and, and bandits. But he had pity, not pity, but he felt suffering with, and that, that would translate by him dressing the wounds, so with him paying for someone to take care of him, etc., uh, etc. Et 
The word pity means a feeling of sadness or fear of an unviable element or a lot that the other has. Either it be deserved or undeserved. So it's, it's distant. You're not with, you're distant. Through beholding the drama of another's suffering, we can contemplate and feel what we might not experience in our very own lives. Both compassion and pity incite in us a feeling of another's suffering. But don't forget, it lacks hope. The feeling of the sorrow or, you know, that's that feeling of the sorrow of sin, the fear of sorrow of someone's been hurt. Widens our universe beyond the narrow confines of my or your immediate experience. We become more human when we know more than ourselves. That's our society. We don't live for the other. We live only for ourselves. Both our knowledge and our feelings allow us to participate in what goes on in the souls of others so that they are no longer alone. But notions of compassion, sympathy, sincerity, mercy, and pity need to be watched closely. They arise more from an emotional than from thought. And this is where the problem is, is that if it's not based in love, it goes, it goes awry. It goes astray. Each of them relate to concepts referring to feelings inside of us. It is caused by our being confronted with a situation, though it be dire, though it be happy, of the other. We do not fully penetrate to the soul of the other for whom we have compassion. No one wants a cold heart. And cold heart is a symptom of pity. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 36, Christ has compassion on the multitudes who are like lost sheep. St. Luke speaks of the tender compassion of our God. Chapter 1, verse 78. The word compassion can border on the word mercy, which usually has something to do with what is being beyond justice without denying it. God's compassion obviously takes us up where our sins leave off. We can speak of pity for victims of an earthquake where no human being is really at fault. We can pity those struck by lightning. But mercy, however, begins where fault exists. God does not deny the freedom of someone who refuses to acknowledge that anything needs forgiveness. We have to be concerned here that something peculiar about compassion and sympathy. Compassion literally means to suffer with another because we see his or her own suffering and can imagine it in ourselves. Yet we have to ask, what is the cause of the other's suffering? We need to do more than just notice that they are suffering. If I say that it is terrible that someone else suffers, no matter what the reason, I soon find myself separating the sufferings from the cause of suffering. And that is so, so much the case. We need that sympathy. We need to feel with. Compassion started out as a feeling the sufferings of another. It can lead step by step to the overturning of a natural order. It did this by making the suffering I feel to be determining factor not the act which the suffering follows. Of course, the great Aristotle was right. He taught us that our passions, feelings, and emotions need first to be ruled by our reason before they can be support, they can support us in living well. But 
Much of our moral life consists in ruling over our passions. Goods in themselves, but by our reason to a proper end. Compassion has a place in a well-ordered soul, but it cannot by itself tell us what this order of soul is. And before ending today, I just wanted to go over certain terms that we, we, we batter around, but we don't see how they affect us. Okay? Empathy is a term that we use for the ability to understand another person's feelings as if they were having them ourselves. Empathy can also mean projecting our feelings onto a work of art or another object. Sympathy refers to the ability to take part in someone else's feelings, mostly by feeling sorrowful about their misfortune. Sympathy can also be used in relation to opinions and taste. Like when you say that you have sympathy for a political cause. Many times people switch these words. Empathy, another way of looking at empathy means that you feel what the person is feeling. Sympathy means you understand what the person is feeling. Compassion is the willingness to relive the sufferings of the other. You know, when one suffers, the, the biggest issue many a time, the loneliness that the one who suffer has, is that others don't understand what you're going through. And by not understanding, the loneliness of the sufferer can cause the person to enter into... Uh, forms of of despair. And we have to be very careful for people because that despair is devastating and it can cause all kinds of other things. It can cause, you know, the, the evilest of all of them, which is despair of the... Uh, of the um, the mercy of God. So if we have those around us who are sick, mostly those in, in chronic or end-of-life situations, many times it's better to reach out to them, to listen to them in their pain, than it is to wait for them because they might not have the ability to reach out intelligently. They might just need someone to understand. Not so much tell them what they already know, but understand where they are. So I'm going to use, to close us up, the, the Webster Dictionary definition of empathy. And this is, is not meant as a, a, a closer, but just for we understand what the word is of empathy and how empathy is key to have compassion. So the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, vicariously experiencing the, the feelings, thoughts, experiences of another, either the past or present, without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objective manner. We as Christians have to be that one who is willing to shoulder the weight that the other has. So let's pray in a special way today that we may have the gift of compassion, true compassion, willing to wear our heart on our sleeve, so to speak, to guide them towards the love of God and an understanding that we can help them when their legs give out, very much like the long distance runner whose legs are giving out but someone filled with compassion picks them up and brings them with them. So let's pray to Hail Mary asking for the grace of being able to do such. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. Mother of mercy, 
pray for us. Mother most compassionate, pray for us. And this is all for today's episode recorded live at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Heralds websites such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, New Insights Multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the gospel. Oh